introduce you to author Kwame. Um, yes, McPherson, who is going to share from his latest book, My Date with Depression, From Mental Uncertainty to Self-Fulfillment. My Date with Depression is an open and honest account of how through his own experiences, Kwame was able to identify why he was where he was um, and how he was able to overcome challenges to become a better man, assist, especially will find this book helpful as he seeks to inspire them to stand in their own truth so they too can talk about their own pain. He considers himself a global citizen and loves telling stories. John, Dr. John Licorice, Deputy Director of Public Health Brand, will interview Kwame today. John has played a vital role in vaccination campaign in Brent, helping people make informed choices and decisions, identifying communities that are vaccine skeptic, and putting the information in front of them in a way uh, the community want. So without any further ado, over to you, Kwame and John. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, good, evening. good evening, everyone. Good evening, people of Brain. Uh, thank you, Dorata, for the nice introduction. Uh, Kwame, how are you? I'm wonderful. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Dr. John. Yeah, I'm great. I'm wonderful. I'm great. I'm glad to be here. You know, I'm glad to be, yeah, a part of this wonderful event. So I'm great. I'm good. It's good. I mean, we've, we're feeling very honoured in Brent to be joined by you, an award-winning writer, trainer, you. uh, entrepreneur. You've got a, a, a range of uh, a skill set. Which is the most important one to you before we start? Um, good question. Uh, which one's the one? I love, I love well, like the writer said, I love stories. I love telling stories. So that is the first one on my list of, of anything that I do. But aside from that, I love football because I'm a referee. So I love football too and I love being amongst young people and officiating games and stuff like that so um so yeah I, I, those are the two things that I, I really do love but storytelling is my thing and I love telling stories helping other people tell their stories and yeah that's that's that's, that's the main thing that's the main thing it's, it's good that you tapped on that this is men's health week and yes. and well this health is Related to well-being, definitely, and and we know that where football is here, which is good for <laughs> for many, yes, for exactly. many men's well-being. Yeah. So I think that's yeah. a that's all, that's always a that's always a that's always a, a plus. Uh, yeah. Just to let everyone can see uh, this wonderful book. Uh, yeah, my date, with de my date with depression. Uh, I guess I would ask why the name my date with depression. Date and depression seem very. Uh... <laughs> uh, the 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 type the well. It's 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 like anything else in life, I guess. Uh, for me, when I when I pen when I begin to put to pen this book together, I didn't know how I needed something to grab the attention of what I've written. I needed uh, something to to grab in terms of people can immediately understand. So, if, for example, you know, if somebody went on a date with a uh, like a man going on a date with a, a beautiful woman, or vice versa, a man going on, a woman going on a date with a man. Sometimes the date would be such a way that it's memorable or forgetful, right? So, it's, so, so the, the, the title in itself is is in a way for me to to share that that had been my date. It's a memorable memorable date, a date that I would always remember of having a part of experience. And like I said, I equate it to going on a date with someone, and for for me, that's the movies, you know. And it, it can be forgetful, I can be memorable, you know. For me, it is a, this is a memorable event, so that's why it's my date with that event. Uh, that's interesting. Memorable. Yes, these experiences, positive or negative, uh, are always memorable. And we felt yes. spoiling it for for, uh, for 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 the for readers. Uh, the crux of it is just a description of depression or description of the event or you're speaking it from a narrative or looking back? 
I'm looking back. It's a narrative of a number of, of milestones, of, of, of points where I didn't know the time that I was going through a particular experience. So it's, it's, it's a reflection of that time, a reflection of where I had been, a reflection of what I had learned, a reflection of how it, my being in that space impacted on others. Others who love me for who I am and me not seeing it or recognizing it for myself. So the, so the book itself is a reflection. And within the book itself, it, when someone reads it, they will see that there's particular things they can do for themselves just to, for their own journey, for their own reflection. You know? So there's a number of exercises within the book itself which enable someone to look at where they've been, where they're, um, where they're going, or, or at a space that they, they have actually experienced that. You know? So for me, it's a, it, it is a reflection, reflective journey you know, um, in that regard. That's good. So I suppose moving from that theme, you, you, you mentioned it's a reflective journey. So is that why you wrote it to, 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 to give that, ref to give that reflective, to describe that reflective journey or was it, what was motivating you to? Uh, okay. What well, motivated me is because as has been alluded to, I'm a writer. I've, I've, I've written a number of short stories, I've written a lot of books in terms of books, I've written non-fiction, I've done a lot of poetry, so I have, I have poetry books, I have non-fiction books, like I said, and, and fiction books, but I have never actually written anything about my journey. There's one particular story that I, I've written before, which is in, in my first short story book called Deep Root Strong Tree, and that story, the story within it is fictionalized, but it's a story about me and, and what I had seen and recognized in regards to the, the, the abuse and violence between my mother and my father. This particular book was me just saying, all right, I have never written anything about myself. This is my particular journey. And I just wanted to share that journey of the challenges that I had during that time and what got me into that space and, and how, I, how I was within that space and how I was able to get out of it. So it was just me being able to catalog a, a, my journey and a, something that is personal to me in that regard, you know? So that that's the reason why it was written, because I've never shared anything before this deep. Um, so I just, just decided, like I, like I said, I'm a storyteller. So I, I love telling stories, and this is a story about me, you know. Okay, thank you for for sharing that, uh, for sharing your story, and I hope uh, uh, others do 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 read it and find it as entrancing as I do. Uh, I notice in terms of timing. Yes. You know, yes. It's, it's, we're now in a time of COVID. We've got men's health COVID unfortunately mm -hmm. seems to cause lots of ill health to men we've got lots of health because of mental health but you wrote this book before so yeah. just a, a think as to what as to was COVID play a role in terms of your decisions to do it now or was it before that or, or if not what why why the time why why because you prolifically produce books why wasn't it just rolled off on the shelf so we could have got to it earlier <laughs> um, and that's an interesting question because I think for, for anyone who writes, so you may, somebody may have written something, I don't know, take for example, uh, 1984, which was written um, years ago, even Animal Farm, you know what I mean? If you notice, those books are written for that time, right? Mm -hmm. But they have a relevance to the present time or years later or decades later. I think my book was written in a time, like I said, in, terms, in regards to my particular experience. So going through that particular episode, but what I've recognized, what I've seen, especially now with the, with the pandemic as the way it has been, is how many people have actually been affected by this time, you know? So my book was written, it's almost like it was being prepared for this time, for this period. So so it's, it's it was in a way before it's time, but it's for this time, if that makes sense. And, 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 and yeah, it's, it's seeing what's been happening with people going through what they're going through, you know, losing their jobs, losing their homes, you know, what I mean, not having any, anywhere to live, um, the pressures of of trying to live on a day to day basis, based on not having any income, based on businesses failing. You know, I I recognize those things because I had experienced that in, in my own years ago, in terms of what I have been through. So the, so it's almost like the the, the examples of, of what I went through are the same thing that are happening today. You know, so, and it will happen going forward. Um, it's just that now it's on a global scale, whereas mine was on an individual scale. If that makes sense, you know. In, indeed, is that application of your lived experience? I think that makes yeah. the book uh, 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 such a good read. Uh, 
But you touched on, uh, it's interesting, you, you, you mentioned Animal Farm, and said, uh, we, 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 which is another book which is so relevant for these times yeah. when you look at it and think, and, and think about it. And I think your book capitalises that in a sense. It's a timelessness to it because you can apply it to the issue of the, uh, uh, of the day. The couple of themes you put there, I noticed, and, and one which, which comes back to it, and it's journey. And there are lots of journeys there. There are journeys for you as a person. There are journeys for you physically. Mm-hmm. Well, Tell me a bit about the, about the journeys and, and... Okay, so so the journey, so throughout life, um, we're all on, on a road, on a particular road. And on that road, we'll come to particular challenges. We'll have ups and downs, the hills and valleys. Um, and it's, it's a way of, of enabling us to be stronger or, and, or enabling us to be weaker. It's how we deal with those challenges when they do come along. So in terms of uh, in terms of my book, when I had moved to North America, set, tried to set up a business, um, and the business flopped, or you know a lot of investments were made, the pressures that started to come from owing a lot of people money is what I internalized. You know, so the financial wars of that time, for example, relationship breakdowns from that time that I experienced are still relevant today in terms of what people are going through. So, so it's 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 it's. In a way, it's, the relevance is such that it, it so so my book can be relevant not only now but be relevant in years to come because depression is something that we all experience. Um, depression, for whatever reason and how it's brought on, can impact on us, like I said earlier, and it impacts on those who are who, those of, those around us who love us for who we are. So 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 in the journey is how you, you, going through that experience. Like for me, it was going into the experience. In the experience and coming out of it, and continue on my on my life journey today, where I am today. So, so that's what the journey is, and then continues. You know, I, would I ever go back to that space? I, I doubt it, but I will have times when I'm in the valley. But that doesn't mean I'm going to go into another state of depression because of, I see what it can do to me mentally, physically, and emotionally, and spiritually. So, I, so I won't be going back into that space, regardless of what's happening now, because it's an experience that I've experienced. You know. And, and that's how relevant I can make it. It's very true. If you've on one journey, it's always a different journey. You can never do the same journey twice. No, you can't. And that's very true. Another thing that you, you touched on there was the issue of, of, of relationships. Yes. How, how was that in a sense of that? How did that influence your journeys and your, your whole approach to this? All right. So, for example, what, what happened when I was, when I, so I had moved from the um, UK to, to North America. Like I said, went and you know got a lot of money from the bank, set up a number of businesses, and, and made a lot of investments. And when it, everything started to crash, I started to internalize that stress, that anxiety, and that was what was pushing me into a particular place. The people around me, so for example, one of the closest people around me at the time was my cousin, and she was the one who identified what I was going through. Then I had my sister come and visit me, and I had my ex-girlfriend come and visit me, and they were the ones who saw what I was going through, but I didn't see for myself. And even the ex-girlfriend that I had at the time, she was trying to help me in terms of me being in that space to, to try to, as someone like trying to give me indicators, as um, trying to give me that wisdom that she had. And I didn't at the time I wasn't listening, you know, because I had to experience what I had to experience. So, so I didn't realize the, the impact of what I was going through until I saw the pain of it, it being reflected. So it's almost like I'm in pain and a reflection of that pain is the, the, the both who are closest to me and they're, they're seeing it and they're feeling it. So it was a reflection of what I was going through, you know? And and so so that is where I began to realize how what I was going through, how it impacted on other people. But it, it took time to, to recognize it for myself. It took time to go through that process um, to, see, to see it for myself and to understand why I was going through and why I was hurting other people because I was hurting myself. Interesting. Yeah. But this is a, a wider, you not only mentioned in terms of those people, there's a wider theme which I sit reading there is about economic enfranchisement, something I think you feel feel strongly about. And, and how does this book fit into that? You talked about your businesses and failing and your persistence. So. Yeah, well, it's, what, it, it's interesting because now I recognise that at the time, I was driven, very driven, which I still am. But I, I, re- I recognize that 
it wasn't the be all and end all. I was making it that. I was making it that if I didn't succeed, if I didn't achieve, if I didn't create a wealth, if I didn't, then I was putting that pressure on myself to attain, which is great because I'm, I'm ambitious, but I was making it the be all and end all and not recognizing that it was okay to fear. It was okay to, to get knocked back. It's, it's fine, you know? It's just that when it, when it does happen, realize that you can pick yourself up and do it all again. You know, at the time, I didn't recognize it and I didn't realize that because I took everything on board and I, and I tried to I tried to solve it myself without trying to ask for help or seeking a solution. And that's why I was in that particular place. So now, when I look at doing business now, I'm, and even if something happens, I'm okay with it. There's always something else that will enable me to get where I need to be, you know? So, so that's what I, one of the major lessons that I learned in terms of creating wealth and creating business, you know? And I'm still here, and I'm not so successful under. Very well, very well, very well put. <laughs> and I, another I really strong theme, and I think it combines a number of themes, economic enfranchisement, journeys, and, and you, you touched on the issue of slavery in African experience. And mm. how, how did that influence your, your, your thinking in terms of this or on generally? Okay. Yeah, well, um, and, and I think uh, one of the things I've always, I always do when, anytime I get a question like this, I always read an extra of what, where the, the transition began from my book, if that's okay. Um, but um, what had happened was, I think it was around 2005, 2006, when I was going through what I was going through, my ex-girlfriend came to visit me in North America and Canada. And she had suggested, you know, she said, listen, I see what you're going through challenges that you have i'm inviting you to africa i said all right i never went to the motherland you know and coming from the, the caribbean as an african caribbean man jamaican in particular i said you know what yeah i've always recognized that our ancestors came from the motherland but i've never actually been there so a number of things happened because at the time i was in a place where i was always hiding i was always trying to have a facade a mask i always wore this mask that everything was fine when i was tearing up inside so it so happened that, you know, we we on a plane and, you know, we got to the motherland and, and there's incidences that happened which, which, um, along the way which showed how, how much I was hiding from myself. Not from her only, but for myself. But when we got to the motherland now and the experience of touching down in Africa was was just the experience alone of, 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 of touching down and you know was was phenomenal, and I and I had to really give reverence to the land, right? Because I actually knelt and I kissed the land. Because for me, as an, a Caribbean man coming back to Africa, is 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 phenomenal in in that sense. And so, the transit a transition started, a spiritual movement, a spiritual change began, you know, and which I didn't recognize and I didn't realize until we had. A particular experience of going to Cape Coast Fort, an enslaving fort, on the, on the east, on the western coast of, of, of Nana, and it was in that particular space where I think the seed of transition began in terms of my healing. Going into the fort itself, you know, I mean, it's an experience, and and even though I can describe it as a writer, which, like I said, I'm. I took a, a couple of minutes to describe what that, that part of the experience, because for me, it's the most powerful part in my book. I, I It was still something which I just couldn't grasp. It was, like I said, it was, it was almost like a conflict was taking place within me, you know, because now I'm from the Caribbean. Our ancestors had been, you know, kidnapped and taken over, over, the, over the Atlantic, Atlantic Ocean, and I now have returned. I've no back home, I, and that's a testament to them in terms of their strength. And that's where this, this, this changes started to happen. But anyway, but, but like I said, I'm, I just want to read a, 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 an excerpt of, of that part of the experience of being in the fort itself. So one of our first trips was to the Cape Coast Enslaving Fort, a whitewashed building on the Ghanaian coastline with parapets that overlook the beach and town. Our guide told us that from the parapets, we could see in the distance the crucifix spire of three churches. And for sure, when we ventured to the top of the fort and looked over the town, we saw the churches and its fires, clearly against the bright blue sky, along with hundreds of people living within the city. Within myself, I found it ironic that those who profess to follow the Christ 
and supposedly love their fellow man allowed a cruel crime of humongous proportions to take place right in their view, or better yet, under their noses. What did that say about them and their religion? I was extremely puzzled. We climbed down steps and made our way into the dungeon below the fort, and there I experienced another phenomenal spiritual moment that has stayed with me to this day. It was dark and foreboding with a single bulb hanging from a wire, its light bouncing from the walls and the rocky roof, causing shadows to flit against the craggy walls. The atmosphere was stifling, and yet I felt I had been bundled in with another few hundred people, many of whom I never knew, into a room made for many less than that number. I felt the spirits calling me, and I was without a doubt affected by their presence, their deafening silence embracing me, I was sure there was an effect on the others too, since most of us, when we re-emerged into beautiful daylight, were crying. Once in the dungeon, our tour guide showed us a rough line running parallel to the floor. He then showed us a window slit, no bigger than one foot high and about half that wide, high up on the uneven wall. Naturally, within the dungeon, daylight could barely be seen. He then explained that because the land on the outside was level with the bottom of the slit, any time rain fell, the water made its way into the cell. Imagine. Hundreds of people, packed in a space made for much less than that. Feces, urine, rainwater, brine, all swilling underfoot, knee high or waist high, or even shoulder high, and this in a confined heat suffocating place. I cried. We made our way out to the ground floor. Nothing needed to be said by any of us. Once there, we stood by the dungeon entrance, and right beside it was another large wooden door. A huge padlock secured it. I was curious and decided to force the jar as far as I was able to. I was dumbstruck. A stench assaulted my nose that would stay with me forever and I still remain to this day unable to describe. When I asked the guide why the room was locked, he said that they, the caretakers or custodians of the fort, were unable to clean it. That's right. They were incapable of getting it cleaned. I was silenced. Here was a room which after hundreds of years was still unable to be scrubbed. I repeat, imagine, after hundreds of years, there was still a room that they were unable to scour of the blood, tears, perspiration, excrement, effluent, and death to the time when we visited in 2006. So that experience basically enabled me to be stripped bare. I, I now had to see all the stuff that I had acquired in terms of what was happening to me but when i when i when i felt that that part of the experience within the fort i realized that i had i what i was what i was going through was nothing in comparison to what our ancestors went through so all the stuff that i was having was a stuff they were they went through much more than i was i was going through at the time and that's like i said when the rehealing began that's when i started to to strip away the layers i had to be naked before them I had to recognize and be in reverence of their depression that they probably went through, their anxiety, which was much, much more than mine. So that is where I started to, that's where the seed was planted for the real healing to begin. I think that's very powerful, Kwabi. Being like yourself, uh, uh, a black person of Caribbean origin, uh, I, I can truly relate to how you describe uh, that passage and uh, I guess recanting the history and how, how that affected. So it's interesting to see that that was a trigger to you having yeah. a look and having a feeling about yourself. Uh, were there were there other triggers in terms of along the it, journey? Yeah, there was because even and even though the seed had been planted at that time, I there was remember I was coming from a place of of learning, of years of learning up to that point. So so it was it was as if. Our relearning was starting to take place. I need to relearn about that my 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 person in terms of being an African man, an African Caribbean man. So there's a conflict. So for example, prior to me going to the to the motherland, I, I ended up being in church. You know, I I I I, I, I was you know, I mean baptized a, a couple of times, and so so there was a, this conflict, this story that was prior to me going to the motherland, and there was an, another story which I now had. A, a new, brand new story, which I now had, which was the rehealing. So there was conflict coming away from the motherland, and 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 the, that conflict continued for a while. So even though I, I had been in motherland, the seed had been planted, I was still in that particular place 
of being of feeling the way I was feeling, of feeling in anxious and depressed because I was going back to the same situation that I had left, right? And then my cousin also again was the one who actually recognized what was going on and she saw the abnormal behaviors that I was having. And she was the one who suggested to me that now that I had been to Africa, what I could do in order to to continue on that path was to go to a bookstore to read and to learn to the fullness in terms of the African story, African story. And and that was where a, a, a supplement to what I had been through in the motherland and the conflict that I was going through, that's when I started to learn about and read, read and start to understand me as an African Caribbean man and as a Jamaican in that regard and how that new, I, it was almost like a rebirth. There was a rebirth taking mm-hmm. place as a re-education. So all the stuff that I had learned prior to the motherland, going to the motherland, the seed being planted, coming away and learning about myself, learning about me as a man, as I said, understanding why I was in a particular situation. And, and and so that was another significant part of the journey in that regard. But And even then, still, and it was, it was, it was a process because it didn't happen overnight. It had, took about a year for me to actually go, go through what I was going through and to get to another place where I'm a year and a half and getting out on the other side a, a better person even though there's still challenges within myself I was a better person than I was prior going to the motherland you know and, and having all that stuff so in the end that is uh, all of the anxiety and depression but when it came to the business failures financial woes I was able to embrace them seek solutions find help um, in, in, but I was still growing I was still learning about myself it's interesting you described, uh, uh, I guess, a, a, almost a, a, a medical analysis of looking at uh, the risk factors, the disease, the symptoms. And as you described what we would term the, the insight into how you develop that insight and how you're able to grow and develop from that. I think that, that's really helpful and really powerful. I mean, depression as mental illness, in fact, like physical illness is always very personal to, every, to, to everyone. Yes. Yeah. Is there anything that you can see in terms of helping other people or that you would like to share with us? Yeah, this um, it's one of the things that I learned about the journey is is always reaching out to other people, even if you haven't heard from them, especially now, you know, especially as we've been been the the isolation, the the yeah, the being locked away, you know, it's now it's a time to reach out to people because now it's where there's the the be particular behaviors which are the norm, the be particular things that someone may be doing which you can recognize immediately that, you know, no, that's something that, let me just give him a call. Give someone a call because we just never know, you know, that call, that phone call may just help someone. I, I was watching a documentary up to yesterday, the day before, and it was about a, 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 an ex, a, a veteran who went to, went to war and came back. And he was, he was struggling with PTSD, you know, post-traumatic stress. And he actually had a gun to his, to his head to shoot to kill himself and it was because he had two dogs and the dogs were scratching on his door that stopped him you know what I mean something as simple as that and when I saw that I was like wow he said it was because of the dogs why he didn't kill himself you know so 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 reaching out for someone as simple as it may seem could stop someone from going to, down a particular road or could help them in the space that they're in so so that's one thing I would always say in terms of being aware about what ha- what's happening with people around us, those who may not have had or may, or may have a particular behavior and it's now turned to a completely extreme to what they were normally, and then finding ways of just, of, of just connecting, you know, and that's the simplest I would put it in regards to into how we can be aware of what's happening around us, you know, um, in, that, in, in that regard, yeah. Yeah. Being awareness, uh, seeking help, speaking yeah. to people. Uh, we know that there are huge uh, inequalities or disparities between the the health of of, uh, yeah. of black men in particular and and and, and the rest. We're more likely to 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 contract a mental illness. We're more likely to be sectioned. We're more likely to be under yeah. uh, under the criminal justice system for uh, uh, for for mental health. What do you think are some of the reasons you think that that could be from your perspective? Um. It's interesting because I think, well, I know that the institutions have been around for a long time. So, for example, we may look at particular institutions that are, are happening today, and it's historical. It's, it's 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 something that's embedded for for generations, and it's happened it's happened from the time of of the enslavement of of African people, 
And I think the institutions that were existed then are the same ones that exist, exist today. You know what I mean? Or, or they've transitioned over time and we now have particular institutions which have their, their roots in a particular way of thinking and behaviors of how they see people and how they see other people, especially when it comes to black people, African. So you find that, the, and it doesn't matter whether, whether it's in health, whether it's in employment, whether it's, you go right across the board. It's the same institutions or they have their roots in a, in a particular time. So it's in the DNA of that particular organization or the, or the mindset of the people which are initiate particular things. One thing I will say is that in order to, for us, to, to bring to the fore these challenges that we have, we have to do it for ourselves. So me penning a book like this could help somebody who's in a particular situation. The more of us that get to speak out about the challenges that we do face, especially as black men, and in, within a system in which we, we do exist and which we do live, will help someone else, you know? Um, and I think the more of us that do that in particular, whatever forum that is, the better it is for us to share and support each other. Because this, the organization or the system that we do live within or live under is not designed to help us to a great extent. You know, it's not designed. So we have to create something for ourselves. We have to be doing the things that we're doing. So like, for example, me penning this book is one way of me helping ourselves. You know, and the more of us that do that in order to help each other, the better it be for us within a particular environment. That's good. We spend a lot of time talking about men. Uh, 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 we've got lots of ladies listening, and, and I'm sure we'll find the book help, helpful. So what is in it for the ladies? Oh, what's in it? Oh, oh wow. Well. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, it, it, it's a rounded person, a rounded man, <laughs> you know. Um, it's because it's interesting because the forums and workshops that I have done a number of times, it's a woman who love the men who actually approach me because the men to a great extent, whether it's bravado, you know, you know, whether it's uh, ego, whatever it is, they find it, they find that they're, they're, they're challenged to, to approach me sometimes because men, men do. When it, one thing I have seen is that men nowadays are we now talking more and more about this particular um, ailment. So we're talking more when, you know, when there are still forums, when there's workshops, men are talking about it more. And black men, black men in particular, which is a great thing. So the women who love us continue to support us, continue to you know, have outlets. So, for example, I had a number of times where women who have a partner and see where the partner is at based on my story, based on my journey. They have purchased my book and handed it over to the partner. You know what I mean? And, when, when, and they will relate to me that... They're glad that they've been able to do so because the part they can see an actual shift in the partner because they're now reading a story where they, they recognize themselves in. You know, they recognize themselves. Well, I'm on the cover, obviously, but they recognize themselves within the story, and that in, in itself helps them to be to be better men. So, so, so the more of us that talk about it, the more of us that write about it, the more of us that uh, are in various forums and and don't feel a way of being open and vulnerable. Then the more it will help us moving forward and will help the women because they will then now have better men, so to speak, in, in terms of, you know, the, the, the partnership that they have, the relationship that they have with an individual, you know. So, so yeah, it's, it's uh, and, and, and as we know, women are the ones who tend to talk about themselves, whereas women don't. So it's a good thing. <laughs> It's, the book has something in it. Uh, the book has something in it uh, uh, for everyone. Uh, uh, we've talked about talked about children actually, because I said you've yes. got the women. I'm talking about children. And one of the things we know is that the educational achievement of, of, of children, particularly of, of black children and other ethnic minorities, is not great. It's one of the things that the council mm. has put as one of its priorities. How how do you see your book in its realms, and what do you think we can do to help help our young uh, help our youngers read more, yeah, engage it's... with? It's, it's, um, Stories. Well, youngers have a way of of the, the time. The, the attention span is very, very limited. So within it, within it, the, the, from from a lot of them, not not all, but for a lot of them. So within that time that we do, we can have them engage is where we need to get the message across. One thing I've realized in the in the time that we're living in, a lot is driven by images, visualizations, um, short, sharp information delivery. So if you can find a way of of Delivering a message, so for example, a lot, a lot of love music. So you find you can get messages crossing through music, through videos, and that is a way of of being able to engage young people. Because, like I said, they're, they're more visual, visually stimulated 
than than before. You know, words now for a lot of them are a challenge just to just to sit down and read even a book. You know, um, so so we have to find a way, which like I said, is is using the, the platforms that are available there, so, the social media, mainly Instagram and Twitter. Those are those are wonderful tools. It's just a matter of designing the message in such a way that they can see themselves in the message. You know, um, and as a writer. I, I tend to do a lot of flash fiction. And flash fiction is the ability to tell a story with 100 or 250 words, or even a thousand words. And but so so I, I've created a, a way of, of, and I intend to have them animated, or have them vi uh, of, of, of tip, um, videoed in such a way that it's within a minute, two minutes, that story has been told, and somebody can gravitate towards that story. And mainly designed for young people, and that's how we be able to get a message across, enabling them to. To open up and enabling to to interact and engage, but the message has to be has to be designed in a way which is enticing to them, and they see themselves within that message. That sounds really good, Karma. I guess this will be my last question since it's been right. a journey. The journey has been a continual theme in the book in terms of our of our discussion today. So I will I will end by saying, is this the is this the final stop on your train station for regard to this particular journey on mental health? Are we are we was um, the train moving on? Uh, the, the train will probably move on into a fictionalized sto novel or story. It will it probably move into a fictionalized because one thing I've also realized and recognized is that, uh, for example, on a big screen, you don't see or I haven't seen a story. We have seen challenges in terms of relationship between. A black man and a black woman when it comes to mental health, but we haven't actually seen a story told from the point of view of a black man, and it, and and him going through just based on, for example, my experience in my book. You know, we haven't seen that, and uh, my intention is to is to write something which we can see from a point of view of a of a individual, a black man on his journey dealing with something like this. So that is that is where that this this story will continue. I do write other stories. But well, for this particular story, that that's where the journey will continue into a fictionalized depiction of a black man having his challenges because of the place that he's in. You know, so that's that. So that's where the story will continue. Thank you, Kwame. It's been really great speaking to you. And Thank I'll you. Uh, hand over to Dorata, who will, I guess, continue with some questions. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Kwame, for your candid.